Hey guys, if you've watched my channel before, you'll have some understanding of the phenomenon of clandestine migration in Mexico and how that involves a notorious freight train commonly referred to as the Beast. Each year, tens of thousands of migrants, mostly from Guatemala, El Salvador and Honduras, use an extensive rail network to cross Mexico's landscape undetected and travel towards the US border. There, they hope to apply for asylum or perhaps cross illegally to work or reunite with family. The unofficial passengers of The Beast are exposed to Mexico's criminal and cartel underworld, as well as the physical dangers of clinging to freight trains for days at a time. The trains are also frequently robbed by the same criminal groups for merchandise and even sometimes derailed in the process. If you want to see more about people migrating using La Bestia, go check out some of my other videos as well. However, the topic of migration in Mexico has been in the media spotlight recently, which is due to Joe Biden's promised legislation reform and the recent actions of the police against the largest Central American caravan bound for the US in history, happening in January of 2021. The US seems to want to put an end to the migrant caravan. However, this form of exodus could be more important than ever for the safe passage of asylum seekers due to the increasing numbers of women and children making the journey and the natural disasters and economic collapse in Central America wreaking havoc across the region. Anyway, what's all this got to do with the title of the video, you might be asking? Well, when we think of hobos, most people probably imagine the Great Depression and thousands of young men taking to the rails in search of work or adventure. However, many people still ride the rails in the contemporary US, a culture that's now closely tied with the punk scene. But the trains of Mexico are not just confined to the journeys of people in migration, with many self-proclaimed hobos and train hoppers taking to the rails as well. So my plan in 2020 was to travel with a friend in Mexico who also happened to play in a folk punk band and enjoys riding freight trains. Although I've not really travelled with my dad before, somehow the question was proposed that he could come to Mexico and we could ride a train together. And obviously we did it, otherwise you wouldn't be watching this video. And the video could end there, but as well as that, my dad's gonna narrate a 24 hour period after the train ride in the south of Mexico where things got pretty serious. Highlighting some of the real dangers and consequences of traveling on the bestia. We'll also talk about my dad's connection to train hopping and the punk scene and how an outwardly rational middle-aged man would be willing to ride a freight train and put himself in that environment in the first place. Why did you take this? Can't you just help me do a video? I'm trying! It's stop <laughs> The trip to uh, Mexico came about by accident, really. <clears throat> Originally, I'd wanted to go to the west coast of the United States, but Dom was busy writing a project um, in Mexico. So I was down at his house in London, and uh, it <laughs> somehow, over some beers and wine, it came to pass that I agreed to go to Mexico. So yeah, uh, my dad kind of grew up in the first wave of the punk scene in the 70s. Ended up playing in a band called Discharge, which was sort of the first hardcore punk band. And so obviously his um, opinions and views influenced me when I was growing up. And so did his stories of that time in his life from, from when he was squatting in London and, and was kicked out of school and went there. And then, you know, it's funny because I ended up being kicked out of school when I was 14 and I went to squat in the punk scene in London today which is kind of by coincidence and that kind of led to me eventually going to the US and the punk scene there and riding freight trains and that influence itself has kind of gone full circle now with me taking my dad on this experience. So when I first sort of got to high school that's when punk really started then we all started to get into playing music as well because the ethos of punk was obviously DIY, anybody could do it. If you saw London then, you wouldn't even recognise it as the same place. I mean, it was a tumble down shack. So I remember staying in a squat in Mornington Crescent opposite the tube station, <coughs> um, which now is worth millions of pounds, obviously. And back then it had no roof <laughs> and it was just a squat. It was like an alien concept to most adults. So lots of kids got kicked out of home. As soon as they dyed their hair pink or whatever, that was it. And so they all gravitated to London. So I used to get kids from like, Wales and Ireland and Scotland and all over the country and little kids, you know, really young kids. So you come out of a gig and so there's three inches of snow on the floor, you've got a soaking wet t-shirt on, you're freezing cold, you've got nowhere to go and I remember one time going back to, I think it was Victoria, with a couple of <laughs> few guys from Tunbridge Wells and the only thing they had was a little tiny gas stove and so <laughs> for reasons only known to them they made some like tea out of somebody's sock. So somebody took their sock off and dipped it in like the snow melted snow to make some kind of flavor in this like drink that we could all drink. 
throughout the 60s, 70s and into the 80s. You know, there's a lot of drugs. One of the most probably prevalent thing was like glue sniffing because obviously it's super cheap. So it's, you know, cheap cider and glue bags. Another thing in the 70s was the level of violence. Every bus ride, every tube ride, every walk down the street was just fraught with the prospect of getting beaten up or having a fight. So you just got really good at fighting. <laughs> so later on, obviously, started playing guitars and making little bands. Uh, and then I did some another band with Gary when <clears throat> he left Discharge for a bit. And then later on, when they put Discharge back together, obviously they phoned me up and asked me if I wanted to do it. And that's how I ended up doing what I did. Just another point, man, this video took so long to make, you don't even know how much editing. So yeah, just if you want to support, just leave a comment, seriously, that's the best thing. And make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. If you want to ask my dad anything, just leave it in the comments, I'll show him it, he can respond to some of them. And uh, yeah, hope you enjoy the video. Uh, we left Wiley this morning, outskirts of Dallas. And I'm quite bored of rain now. Tomorrow is Laredo, uh, meet another of Dom's friends. I try to put off having too many preemptive thoughts of what Mexico might be like from the point of view of what we're doing. I'm sure Cancun's great, etc. But as for scenery, there isn't any. Unless you want to look at 500 different McDonald's, which are all exactly the same. I'm in the US right now, I'm just trying to pick up some documents in my car Then I can leave to San Luis today I've only been just on the border in Tamaulipas Like, in the last couple of days But I'm obviously remembering to the, the previous trips I've done When I just took this camera and sort of diligently recorded everything in this way, in this simple way So I drove down the side of the yard and just, like people driving very quickly on this small highway next to it. You wouldn't really know if um, someone hadn't told you that there was anything wrong. I'm sure I've been in many places like this before and been close to danger, but you just, you know, unless you know the situation, it see, appears normal. But I went all the way down to the bottom and there was one guy with like a sort of AR-15 in black and I did a U-turn. I'm sure a lot of deaths have occurred in that small area and a lot of suffering. It's crazy. Escapula Guatemala, decidí emigrar porque tengo un problema visual y quise llegar a los Estados Unidos para ver si podría yo acabar lo de la operación, pero se me ha dificultado mucho aquí en México por, por la mafia, la migración, los policías, falta de documentos y aparte la seguridad en el tren. Sí, soy la primera persona de mi familia guatemalteca que quiero cruzar a Estados Unidos. Es muy inseguro, es muy frío en la noche. Más que nada, ahorita ya sacaron nuevos guardias de seguridad. Ya traen armas, antes no traían, ahora ya traen armas y traen patrullas nuevas y nos bajan. Sí, nos han correteado, nos han parado, nos hemos tirado del tren, nos hemos quebrado huesos, narices, frentes. Nos han cortado pedazos el tren por lo mismo del, del susto de que hay retenes y a veces la gente se tira a altas velocidades en el tren y salimos rodando o muchos caemos en las ruedas y perdemos partes de nuestro cuerpo y se acaba el sueño americano. Okay, we're at the yard, no trains right now. However, I got wrecked last night. I've only slept for about four hours. Excited's not 
really the word I would use. It's more interested, what it's all about, why you do it. I don't really know why. To be I think why, I'm going to think that as well. Why I again. wouldn't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> ¿Qué piensas uh, de mi papá montando en el tren? Me gusta. ¿Cuántos años? 55. 55. Yeah. Train is coming. Just gotta go for it. Might be the wrong train. Yeah. We went back to Eric's wife's family's house. Her dad works for KCSM so he basically called the train companies and said like when are you running this train to the actual dispatcher guy and he said 7.30 tonight at the moment. So let's go back to the yard now and probably hopefully only wait like half an hour. So I'll go get him. You almost missed the ladder, I felt like. You were a bit behind there. Yeah, it was... Yeah. It was alright? Well, it's all a bit... What I would do personally is jump off now and then grab the back end of this. When there's space, because it's going so slow. No, come on, quick, do it now because it's going to come out the yard. If there's space to... Come on, you have to do it. Oh, careful, both face forwards. Yeah, that's perfect, we've got to fucking pull. Right, now get down, lie down in here. Okay, we're all in. A lot of people probably already got up. Been a couple of hours on this train now. My dad had a little bit of a sleep without his sleeping bag, just sat, just sat there. There's loads of people on this train because there was a caravan from Honduras like a month ago, and I think a lot of people managed to get through the security and break off from the group inside riding the train. So there's nothing here. It's completely. I can't film anything. It's completely dark. You're gonna get hurt, buddy, dude, and it's a bit slower. Okay, face forwards. Face forwards. Nice one, nice one. There you go. That was a bit fast. So far, survived the first trip. Managed to get on and get off without face planting. It was a bit cold at points, but it was not too bad. You had a little bit of sleep on there, as best you can, in the heart of the beast. There's this train, which is how you can see me right now, the headlights of it weighing this direction. Maybe it's going to leave this way. So I think the best plan is just get it straight back. Okay, got to get on again. Anything, anything, just grab anything. He's done it, he's done it. Oh, that was fast man, I felt scared. He got off again because there's no floor and then 
got back on because I told him to, but now there's no floor, he's going to have to climb over it. There's a ride back there. Sorry, bud. Care for your knees, it's a bit painful. Ah. Ah. Oh, fuck. That's not good. Okay, there's no branches, there's no branches. Let's go for it, just run over. It's absolutely smashed by the branches. Yeah, there's a ride on the other side there, so if you want to do that one, I didn't notice that they didn't have floor. I just thought the train was flying. Which it was. You take too many risks too soon. I know. Where's Red she gone? He's Where's... just on top of this one. Might be a little bit dumb, but hey, look, there's a normal brainer. Get on, get on. That was faster than I was expecting. I nearly missed that then. Now we're all on different cars, and I've got double brakes. Stupid, really. Do you want to change even further back if it stops fully? If it starts going, you won't make it back to anything else, will you? No, but like, we're going to be good, I think, here. So I've got another one of these, I guess, yeah. Oops. Phone's been dead for ages, no idea what time it is. But I don't know what town this is, because I don't have my phone, so... Maybe I'm going to take a little sleep now because it's not that interesting, it's flat, it's the middle of the day, we didn't sleep that much. I just woke up, I'm really disoriented, I've been asleep for hours, well, everyone's been asleep for hours. This train's just been going, because on the way back it's all uphill basically, the train's just been going like 10 miles an hour the entire trip basically. It started off obviously quite difficult. A long day sat in the baking sun, the train going at night, so we managed to jump on that, but obviously it was in the dark, which uh, for the first time makes it a bit more exciting. And just obviously lost to see that I've never seen before. Um, but okay, not too tired now, we've all slept a little bit in between. You know, we've just got the last final bit going into the town. Basic human needs is what's required now. I don't think I've been this dirty since I was probably about five. Coffee would be really good. You want to go for it here, mate? Yeah, let's go. We're having a walk, guys. It's my dad's first freight train. Pretty cool to do that with him. That was fun, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Some element of it. Some element That would have been good. Look, it's even got fabrics in there and all sorts. So that part of the trip 
with my dad on the train um, was over. Part of the reason why my dad really came was was to kind of get an insight into some of the work I was doing and experience it for himself. So despite the fact that the next part of the journey wasn't specifically about the train anymore, um, the lines, the freight lines of Mexico are kind of a world within themselves. It, risk is unavoidable in that scenario and so the next parts of the video may, you know, be distressing in a sense, but um, I knew even if my intention wasn't to be documenting that specifically, just being in that environment, it's very difficult not to encounter these, these risks and um, difficulties that are associated with that entire experience. So the first thing we did is drove straight to the far south of Mexico. So it's basically a town called Medias Aguas. It's just one, one street and there was, there was stuff going on everywhere and police and uh, it got its name, Medias Aguas. When it was at the times of steam trains, the town just purely existed so that there was a water tower that could refill the steam trains at halfway points in the middle of the kind of forest. So the reason we were going to this specific town, Medias Aguas, is because there's uh, the head of the Semex company, which is a company that runs freight from the town, a hurricane had hit the line further south a while ago and it's, there's no information online on whether the trains run or what's happening. And there was also a medical train there which is a new concept in Mexico and basically it services rural and indigenous communities. So yeah, we'd finished all of those uh, interviews and actually a large group of people from the caravan had managed to get through and catch the train in the southern Mexico and this is one of the first places where it stops. So yeah, we were parked in the car and we were getting ready to leave as it was nearly dark and that was the plan. And we were outside of the town, like nearer to the train yard. And at that point, this, this guy ran up to me and he was like, help me, help me, my friend's injured here in the bushes. So yeah, the guy repeats it a few times without looking at me in the eyes and I can smell the smell of glue and alcohol quite strongly. So I know that he's like drunk and he's high. You know, I didn't, I hesitated. And at that point he just dropped onto his knees and he just started crying like this. So at that point I start, sort of jogging down towards the train yard and uh, and I see a figure like crawling on the floor a few hundred feet away. No, no, no. There's this guy basically on the floor um, and there's like a trail of blood and his shoe is soaked in blood and uh, we, we like lift him over and his leg is, is snapped in half and the bone is out of his leg. And he tried to catch the train but it's not a train you're supposed to catch. Um, it had chemicals on and they don't want migrants on there for the dangers. So it comes out of the yard really, really quickly. And he tried to grab it being drunk and he, he missed his foot on the ladder. And his foot went through the ladder and hit the wheel. And he was just stuck into the ladder with his, uh, with his leg. And eventually getting dragged on the floor, it broke his leg and it came out. So we didn't know what to do and we're looking around and there's like some plastic rubbish on the ground. So I picked up a bin bag that was all dirty and I, I tied it really tightly around his leg because the blood is coming everywhere and they were crying, both of them, and they were really panicking and they were sort of in this delusional state. I'm sort of carrying him, but he's like going limp or unconscious from kind of the, the stress or the panic of the situation. And eventually I can't carry him anymore. And I ran uh, all the way into the town and to this medical train and I go to the policeman and I run up to him and I say, help, help, there's someone back here in the train line who's injured. And he's looking at me with this big gun like, ha, yeah. So I ran inside an operating theater on the train and I said, help, help, come on to these doctors and explain what was happening. And these doctors got here and we're getting on the stretcher and finally people realize he's actually injured and they're, they're cutting his clothes off and trying to stop the bleeding. And we got him to the train station. I basically, I gave the, his friends some money, enough so they could eat in the town like for a week or two. And, and that's when we were like, okay, I think, you know, it's time we can basically leave the town now. The, the situation was dealt with. And yeah, I just filmed a few clips of my GoPro as it was helping. I had it just in my pocket at the time. So I'm parked at the station, um, just keeping an eye on the car and sort of seeing what's happening because uh, originally we wanted to leave before it got dark. Even though the town was like still busy and there was still like fun for and people like sort of having a fiesta and there was like police around. I'd noticed that there was a pickup truck. Actually, I went to turn the car around and I saw him disappear off down the road. And then there was like a couple of guys sat on the taxi bonnet that was parked outside and I'd noticed that one of those guys was like watching us. And as we came out of the village, this taxi came past us and I kept going faster and faster and he kept going faster and faster. And I'm probably doing about 60, 70 miles an hour by this time in the dark in a place I've only been down once the other way. 
So we came around this corner and it was like, oh. <laughs> there's a car parked on the left and there's a woman sort of in front of the car sort of going, you know, slow down or whatever. The pickup truck that was at the station is parked on the right, across the road the other way, and there's a small gap in the middle, which I presumed the taxi was going to try and fill. So I just nailed it up the side of the taxi Pushed the taxi out of the way to get through the gap in the middle of the two cars. They basically then chased us all the way back to the motorway. Fuck, oh, man, it's gonna rip off the wheel or puncture or something. And then they rubbed him and tied him and drove him in a cornfield. Everybody notices that we're not around here, you know. Even the cops told me that they saw us when we arrived there. So we had to carry on for several hours to get back to uh, another town, Tierra Blanca. You know, there's no tourist sort of stuff there, so the only places we could find, you know, Google Maps or whatever, was a couple of motels in town. They have like plywood edifices in front of them painted. So one had palm trees and like a mermaid and stuff, and the other one had a castle with like portcullis entrances. And it's just a courtyard with garage doors all the way around. A woman appears at a little window. Basically, the gist of it is how long do you want a room for? Well, like the night. <laughs> Obviously, one of the garage doors behind us sort of zzz, opens and it's like, brilliant result. And when you go up into the room, it becomes a bit more apparent this isn't necessarily a normal sort of motel. There's a giant bed. One wall is what appears to be a two-way mirror and the other wall is like a giant aquarium, floor to ceiling, but with no fish. It's all lit up and it's got aquarium type things in it. Once we turn the lights off, I'm staring at this massive wall, which is like a big mirror. And at some point I start seeing what I think is people moving the other side. And that's when you, you started to hear all the action outside of our room. So there's like the obvious sounds of people doing what they do. As soon as I started to fall asleep, it all started to kick off. So I put all my clothes back on. <laughs> Ranchy sort of woke up with all the noise going on and then me and him were like listening. Eventually we worked out that basically a woman had come and her husband was in a room down the corridor with another woman. So they were trying to get into the room. Obviously he was in the room with this woman and like people trying to like break down doors and the place is basically a brothel and obviously it's run by the cartels. Uh, and then the next morning we obviously got up quite early and got out of there quite quickly. Drove back to Orisaba where uh, Don Moranchi carried on their trip on the train. We're in Chris's house. Uh, he has another house, I didn't know that. This is the third time we visit him. We were, well, fourth. Okay. Hola. Hola. <laughs> Christopher no se encuentra. Anda de viaje. ¿Dónde? Se fue para Veracruz, ¿no? I think I lost him. Uh, 
me and five more hundred teenagers. I'm pretty worried, man. This train's not slowing down at all. I've let them see me on the train. This even has a caboose. This has security on the back end. So hopefully they're gonna fucking kick me off. I can run away. Okay, I'm in some small town near this place called Canada. This morning I got on the train and, well, the train wasn't supposed to be ridden. And um, Ranchi, he he didn't get on. There's 250 people here. The group that I saw in Medias Aguas and some other people. Yeah, children, Dominicans, Haitians, two-year-old girls. But even this town, the way people look at me, everyone's riding horses in this town farming. You know, it's not, it's not normal for me to be here. It doesn't make sense. And it's not that it's inappropriate to ride the train. Many people come and ride the train from America just because they travel the world by freight trains. You know, they travel US. This situation is different when there's 250 people who want to fucking eat with their families and make a better life for themselves. All the things we've already explored, discussed. Okay, the train's here. I was just talking with a few people and I can't film and it's not a thing, but do you know what? Like, someone lost their leg actually, fully lost their leg yesterday morning in Orizaba. Yeah, it seems a very common occurrence and because of the caravan at this time and stuff, a lot of people leaving at this time, so busy. The police are all moving into like action to like watch this train come in. I can hear it come in now. She was just telling me stories like, so the guy fell at, like uh, was asleep and the migration police came and he just jumped off the train, lost his bag, fell, cut his legs and all f***ed up and he's just walked three days here. See, see, see. Yeah, man, this, I did this train 20 years ago. Yeah? This is my second, second sure. blow. It's crazy. I got some little ones in the United States. Yeah. Three little ones. Yeah. I got to go back. Which state? Mississippi, Mississippi. So what you just heard was uh, a man I was speaking to on the train that I'd met. And uh, we got talking for maybe 20 or 30 minutes about his life. And uh, we were just trying to enjoy ourselves, you know, after all this stress and the train was stopped. There were so many people on, on the roof already, like 50 people. And it's at this point when we got back down, the police boss, I don't know who he was, he came over and he starts shouting at us, why do you go on the roof? Why do you, you can't do that? And the guy's trying to ignore him as if he's experienced this before. And I'm, I'm like, well, you know, what do you mean? But moments later, he came back and he was much more angry saying the exact same thing. And my friend just got up and just ran. And they ran up the train and then they ran back down the train and I seen him with his shirt ripped off and they were just dragging him by his arms and his feet were dragging along the floor and they just threw him into the back of this truck. There was two more guys sat next to me and at that point he starts walking back up to the car again. So I get my bag and I get all my stuff and I put it in the hole of the grainer and I'm tucked in there and he comes back and he's shouting and the other two guys are sat there and they don't want a problem so they're looking at me in the grainer hole I'm like don't look at me you know. And at that moment the train just slams and starts moving at like two miles an hour and he starts climbing up in the machete and the train starts picking up speed and he just climbs back down and gets off and then we just go through all these big kind of waste fields all this burning plastic coming over the train there's yeah there's very corrupt and punitive police practices in that whole region especially in central mexico there's so many robberies and issues with the train
Claudia again. Time to bail for the train. La ciudad es para, 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 para salir para, para querer traer hacia allá. ¿Me entiendes? tres años de no ver a mi mamá y espero estar unida con ella. ¿Y cómo te imaginas que hemos estado sufriendo? Que estoy allá alegre con mi hermana. 